Hey everybody, Coach here. Hey, welcome to this week's episode. Glad you took a couple of minutes. Hey, this particular episode is all about fall temperatures, fall chores in the residential landscape. I am so glad you're here. You know, fall is my number one season out of the whole year. And why? Well, it basically boils down to about three things. Number one, we've endured the heat of the summer. We've worked really hard and we've kept the landscape going and blooming. And now it's like, it's time to relax just a little bit, a little bit and get reinvigorated for those few chores that are left before we tuck in our landscape for the winter. So cooler temperatures, beautiful fall colors like over my shoulder here, and the new energy that you get when you get those fall colors and those temperatures and you wanna get out back out in the yard without sweating bullets every single minute of the day. Hey, are you with me? This week we're talking about those fall chores. We've got about eight of them, and some are labors of love and some are maintenance issues. But let's dive into it, shall we? Hey, I'm Matt and you can call me coach. Every week I bring to you landscape design concepts and theories, ideas and solutions so that you guys can tackle landscape projects yourself, maintain a landscape the best way possible without having to pay big dollars, and in the long run, be a heck of a lot more self-reliant and save a whole lot of money in the process. Man, after doing this green industry thing for 20 years, I will be bringing a lot of experience and knowledge to you, the new modern educated self-reliant homeowner of today. Man, I love this time of year. I told you at the top of the show, it is my favorite. Look at this, in a jacket for the first time this year, for a long, long time. Let me tell you, it's in the low 50s right now. We're up in northern Minnesota, way up on the Gunflint Trail, enjoying some of the really unique lake aspects and area this place has to offer. And the place is virtually empty now, just a few weekenders some grouse hunters and that's about it. So what are we talking about today? I think, you know, there's a certain time of year for everybody. For me, it was probably about a week ago when suddenly Maestro and I were outside enjoying a glass of wine and we suddenly realized, damn, it's only after seven o'clock and it's dark already. That's when you realize it's no longer summer. Yeah, it was still a little warm then, but dark. And that's a, that's a trigger for me. That's when you know, hey, it's time to get busy. It's time to get busy outside for about the next four to six weeks, depending on where you're at, and get to those fall landscape chores. We're gonna discuss those areas of the landscape that can really take your attention and turn it into huge returns on investment come next spring and summer. So let's take a look at those eight really quick, and then we'll break them down one by one. In this video, I'm also gonna tell you the why behind each and every one of them which is always a good educational tool. Okay, number one, turf lawn of all varieties. In the fall time, turf lawn is a very important maintenance item, and to prepare it for winter, you're gonna do a couple little tasks that'll really make it go solid into winter, and it will explode in the spring for you. Number two are perennial beds. Perennial beds that you've you know, labored over and have really gotten a great bang for your buck out there all summer long. Now it's time to do a little maintenance. Drainage systems and irrigation. We're gonna do those number three and four, drainage and irrigation. Number five, annuals. Number six, mulching. Number seven, bulbs. And lastly, pruning. Those big eight. And I, I say those in kind of a order of importance because the more you put to it, the, the better you're gonna get it through the winter especially if you're in harsh winter areas like where Maestro and I are right now, upper Minnesota. Okay, back to number one, turf lawns. Turf lawns this time of year, especially the cool season grasses, are getting a, a second lease on life. They love coming out of those hot summer months, those hot, sticky, muggy summer days, and feeling that cool air. When the ground starts to taper off in temperature, so does the air. Man, that ryegrass and fescues and bluegrass, it all goes, hey, hey, time to get going for a few weeks. And they really do. And in order to take care of that turf lawn, here's a couple little things that you might wanna consider doing. Thank you, Red Squirrel. Number one is aeration. You know, back in that uh, 
that video and that podcast I did called 412 Lawn Care. Check it out if you get a chance. But there I tell you about every other year doing an aeration program. And it'll really keep the root zone full of nutrients from composting and fertilizers. And it just basically allows that uh, hardening soil to relax just a little bit. So getting out there and aerating, raking those cores off, or you can let them sit for about a day, depending on your temperatures or rain, and then you can mow them and break them all up that way. Then come in and put a, a nice layer of peat or a nice layer of quality organic compost over the lawn. Put in some, some fall and winter fertilizer and even some seed if you want to and top dress it if you can. And man, you watch what happens within a two week period. That lawn, if you think it's coming back to life now, will literally explode on you for about the next four to six weeks. You can also maintain and do some of this stuff for your warmer season grasses, your Bermudas, Bahias, centipede grass, and even your zoysia. You, know, you can go in and aerate. Now granted, it's a little harder because those grasses are a little tougher. They got quite a substantial thatch layer and thick on the top um, root system. That You really need a good vertical aerator rather than the wheel works a lot better. But then go in and you can compost that. You can fertilize just as well. And it'll continue to go until old man winter comes in and really shuts some of them down, like Bermuda and those guys. In the wintertime, you just have that Serengeti tan lawn look that we're so familiar with in the colder regions of the country. Hey, how about number two, those perennial beds? Man, I sure did like getting in in the fall time and going in there and weeding, making sure everything was all cleaned out I really did a lot of dividing in the fall with a lot of the perennials, especially things like uh, Rudbeckia, Daylily, Hostas, and the like. You know, getting in there and giving those guys a, a three to one type of division and then replanting those in other parts of the yard. Talk about free plants. Or if you have enough already, but you still need to divide, Maybe some family or friends or neighbors might enjoy some of the, the efforts you've got to get those perennials that big. Once you get that, I really suggest you get in there, do a little bit of pruning. You know, if, the, if you have like your hostas are laying down already, for some of you, probably not, but up here, yeah, they're laying down already. And you can go in and, and nip them just above the ground level. Now, some of the other ones you wanna cut right at ground level, some you wanna leave up just a bit and come in and compost. Come in and compost the whole perennial bed. Put in some fall and winter feed or some organic fertilizer in there with a really low nitrogen content, more, you know, 0, 10, 10, something like that, and then put it to sleep for the winter. Let those slow release organic compost nutrients eke down into the, the bed as well as that organic fertilizer. Put them to bed. All right, moving on. These little efforts for your perennials are gonna pay you in a 10X fashion, a really good investment return next spring and summer. The composting and fertilizers provides a couple of things. Number one, food for the season. You know, it'll take up some of that nutrient and stuff before it gets really cold. And with all that nutrient stored up in the root system, it can make its way through the harsh winter weather and come flying back next year. It is a great way to get a good investment on your perennials by taking care of them now in the fall. I really suggest putting down a, a good two inch layer, a two inch layer in the perennial beds, and then get in there with a grass rake and rake it all nice and smooth. It'll look a little funky for a while, you know, because most of your perennials have been pruned back and it's kind of a naked bed. But if you live in a part of the country that you can take on another topic we're gonna talk here in a minute, then you got some more work to do. All right, our next topic, drainage systems. This time of year, for those of you who are not snowbound all winter or sub-zero temperatures or really low single digit teen type of temperatures, drainage systems this time of year are really affected if they have not been maintained. If you're in the area of the country that is primarily rain soaked, I hope, especially out west this year, or a rain snow mix most of the, the winter, then now is the time to get up there and start dealing with the drainage systems that you have on your house and under your house. When I say this is now's the time if you've got fall leaves and we're at a, a load full of fall leaves falling right now that you're gonna wanna get out there and blow the roof off if you can. Blow those gutters out 
If they're filled with leaves, don't, don't try to wash it. All you're going to do is wash them down into the system. If you haven't already, I really suggest that you go out and get one of the little leaf strainers and put it in the downspout. Or make a bigger investment and make sure that you can put the, the leaf covers on the top of your gutter system, which will almost prevent this forever. Now, when I used to take care of my house on Wee Patch Ranch, and also other people's houses when I was doing landscape construction, I would throw those in as a bonus, you know? Hey, since we're here, we'll, we'll clean your gutters and do your drain system. It's always a good way to get a job. But I would always make sure that we shoved a hose down a downspout or two and see how the system performed. If it did not perform well, if it started to back up at a catch basin or back up the gutter for gosh sakes, we knew there was a bigger problem. And with that, we would put up a, a rotojet or something and clean it out. But most of the time, most of the time, the systems flowed, but just not perfectly. By the time we got done, they would flow and the terminal ends out near the street or in the front lawn or wherever they happened to be, they would flow really well. And that was really a good peace of mind for a customer, you know, to know that that system is done and you're not going to have to worry about ponding and flooding and everything else that goes along with a poorly functioning drainage system. You guys can do this yourself. It's not hard. It just takes a little bit of time and effort and it won't cost you a contractor's wage. So think about it. Make sure that when the heavens open up in the winter and you guys are getting a lot of rain overnight or during the daytime, you can look out that window out in the front yard and you can see that water coming out really, really nice. That is good self-reliant confidence that you've prepared your drainage system once and for all for the winter. If you'd like a little bonus on that, make sure you're doing this about twice a year. After winter is done, after winter is done, and then again this time of year in the fall. Your main goal is to rid the drainage system of bugs, rodents, any leaf buildup, and especially sediment buildup. You know, sediment is the, is the killer of a drainage system. And over the year, especially with like composition roofs or agricultural dust in the air, which we were very familiar with where we came from, this kind of stuff eventually washes off roofs into gutters and down into drainage systems. And that drainage system, which starts out full round, three inch or four inch, will suddenly start to fill up with sediments. And once you get up past the halfway point, you're asking a drainage system to work way too hard. So that's where you want to flush it out and get rid of all that debris that's in there. It'll look kind of yucky when it comes out, but wash it off the lawn, clean it out of the gutters, do whatever you have to do. But generally, once a year, but I suggest twice a year maintenance, and you will never have that problem. Hey, with these cooler temperatures, it brings me to the next topic, and that's irrigation. Irrigation right now is a big, going through a huge paradigm shift, trying to keep everything nice and wet through the hot summer months. And now all of a sudden, like up here, it's 52 degrees and we got a half inch of rain last night. So big change in weather. The lawns love it, the landscape loves it, but the irrigation system doesn't need to be coming on nearly as much. So now it's time to pay attention to your irrigation timers and also maybe winterizing already for your system. Down south, California, not quite yet, I'm sure. But up north, you're gonna have to start thinking about it in the next few weeks. So for those of you up there, I'm sure you know all about winterizing an irrigation system. If not, check out some of the YouTube channels. It is something that you can do really easy yourself, or you can hire it out once a year to have the systems blown out, either way but don't leave them filled with water, especially if you're prone to freezing. You're just asking for burst pipes and everything underground, and you're gonna have a heck of a, heck of a landscape irrigation bill next year. So make sure you winterize. For those of you who are still irrigating, I can guarantee you with the cooler temperatures, you're probably time to dial down a day or two off the weekly uh, schedule. And with that, how about a few less minutes per zone for sure? You know, once you get into the, you've been in the 90s, now you're in the low 80s or high 70s, and then you drop into the 60s, that's, that's like take a day off every 10 degrees of temperature drop. It's a good way to kind of remember it. You know, if you have, if you have a soil that is kind of sandy loam or sandy, you'll still have to throw some water on there. 
but you don't have to throw that much on it if you have a clay loam or a clay soil because that water is really staying in there and the lawn quite frankly just doesn't need that much water anymore you're actually drowning it and causing the root system to shrink underground from six to eight inches down to three to four inches so knock it down a little bit. The other thing is, is if you haven't invested in a really good timer, and check out next week's video, we're gonna talk about timers, you know, and a rain sensor, it's a great automatic way where you're not having to run out to the garage when the heavens open up, because your rain sensor is gonna take care of it, and it'll turn your whole system off. It's a good video, you ought to check it out. For you guys out west, you know, I'd, I'd hate for you to be that house on the block that forgets to Turn off your timer when you're expecting rain or when you actually get rain. And for gosh sakes, Oregon, California, Arizona, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, all you guys that are suffering exceptional droughts again, don't be those people that are got a timer way off base and maybe you had a power outage and now days aren't what they're supposed to be and you're watering when you're getting a rainstorm and it's coming on on the wrong day. So time to go out there and check it. Okay, next topic, annuals. Annuals are a great way to reinvigorate if you're not in a freezing cold area, reinvigorate the yard with some fall and winter color. I used to always go to the nursery in the fall time when it was cooler, crowds aren't there, the selection isn't quite as big, but I always knew what I was looking for. You go out there and, and look for your violas and your pansies. You, know, you look for your calendulas and you look for your, your primula or your primrose plants. These things put in there can really add a lot of color during the colder months. And then come holiday season, hey, go out and look for some red and white cyclamen that you can tuck in somewhere, either in a container or whatever. And then don't forget the poinsettias at the front door and inside as well. It's a great way to really invigorate uh, kind of a tired landscape and probably you might be the only ones on the block that have it. You know, get some four inch color that actually has color going on already. The cell packs, cell packs you sure popped in the ground about two to three weeks ago. But four inch color or bigger, now you've got instant color and instant impact. Okay, moving on, another way, and you can use this particular topic towards the end of the one I just talked about, annuals, and the ones that are coming up. This particular one is mulching your beds. Mulching your beds that are thin with mulch. They don't have any pizzazz anymore. You've done all your raking of your fall leaves. Now it's time to get in there and put a good layer of dark organic compost or some really fine bark in there and make it really look, really look sharp, look new. There's nothing better than brand new mulch in a fall garden with a little bit of annual color that's popped into it to really have that flagship of the yard in the block. Mulching beds as it slowly breaks down through the rest of fall, winter, and into next spring really adds a lot of organic nutrient to your soil beds and really gives them a great boost, a slow release of food throughout the winter and next year as well. So mulch those beds, give them a good two inch or more. The more you give, the more insulatory value it will have in the beds and it'll really protect that root system. Okay, our next topic. Remember we talked about annuals. Now we're gonna talk about bulbs. And bulbs are one of the best labors of love that I used to put into Weed Patch Ranch and also into all the homes I've ever had. You know, the fall collection of bulbs are in most garden centers and nurseries right now. You can go find your daffodils and tulips. You can find your crocus and anemones, just to name a few. But it's nice to go out there and prep those perennial beds this time of year or if you have annual bed, you do bulbs first and then you plant your annuals on top. And you know what? After you've done it correctly, come January, February, early March, hey, they remind you what you did last fall. You know, they start poking their little heads up through the snow or through the mulch or through your winter color. And they give you that burst of late winter and spring color. Really great surprises. And then when you're all done with them, you know, you can rubber band them down to the ground and let them go to sleep, cut them off later in the summertime and repeat. Okay guys, last one, pruning. Pruning during the fall is really kind of a tricky one. When you're doing pruning in the fall, what you're trying to do is cosmetically correct anything that is in the shrub and tree area of your landscape. Your goal for fall pruning should not be heavy. It's more for cosmetic correction and a little bit of strength and structure. 
not a heavy prune. So going into shrubbery and trees, it's things that are laying down, things that are look out of place, and you go in and just do basically a nip and tuck. Your heavy duty prunes come at late winter and early spring when you know you're gonna get that flush of new growth and all the, the, the harbinger of winter is gone. You don't wanna do a big thing now and in two to three weeks you've got new growth pushing out and suddenly you get a frost snap or worse and very well you could end up killing your trees and your shrubs. So just go light, just little bits. I always suggest if you have to get a lopping shear out, you're probably going too big. Hand shears, maybe a light lopper here and there, and that should be about it. Pruning is just for cosmetics in the fall. For those of you with fruit trees and berries and that kind of stuff, time just to let them go to sleep. Let all that leaf, that leaf structure that's up there, take in all the food it can and let it drop it down to the root zone. Not the time to prune heavy because that food needs to descend. Those leaves are the cafeteria and that root zone is the collector of all that nutrient. Storing up for next year. Then come next February, early March, depending on when you're at, then you can go out and prune the berries. You can go out and prune the, uh, the fruit trees and get ready for next season. Hey, one more thing, little bonus one for you, your lighting system. If you guys have outdoor lighting, make sure you go out there and adjust your timers for the new daytime hours. Don't forget the end of this month when we go back to standard time, except for you, Arizona, whatever. If you guys happen to have a system that is photo cell operated, make sure you go out there and clean the lens of your photo cell, turn on the system manually and go out and check each and every bulb, make sure you got everything working. And if you haven't, if you haven't, you know, swung over from incandescent over to LED, I suggest you do a little bit at a time. Your bulbs are gonna last 10 times longer and be a lot more reliable. All right, hey, there we go. Eight solid ones with a bonus of the lighting one. I hope you guys got something out of this. Get out there and enjoy the fall time. Enjoy the fall color and the cooler temps. Get ready for those holidays ahead and tuck in your landscape with these few little tasks. Make it a team effort. Get the whole family out there, or family and friends. You guys enjoy the fall. You got about another four to six weeks or so before some of you get smacked with winter. And I'll see you guys next Friday. As always, to your landscape success. Take care. Turf lawn is a very important maintenance alley. <laughs> time to readjust your timer or your foot. It's like he's up there going. <laughs> you think you're a star? <laughs>